All righty. All right, everyone, welcome to school today. All right, so we're going to get started. We're mostly going to be using the packet that says period one review activities. Um, it also has a map of the North America, which is going to be definitely something that we probably haven't heard too much about um, in our history classes since, honestly, world history at most, maybe a little bit of US one. Yeah. Oh, I am fantastic, Max. How are you? Oh, they were awful. They were awful. And right now I'm dying for that. Did you get those that that uh, Jersey mice for them? I love it. All right. All right. So let's get started. Period one represents information from 1491 to 1607. 1491 represents pre-Columbian. Why do I call it pre-Columbian? Yes, perfect. It's before Columbus sails the ocean blue, because when does he sail the ocean blue? 1492. Very good. Yeah, so this is the pre-Columbian period. What's significant about 1607? Definitely not. No. All right. No, definitely not. It's the founding of Jamestown. You absolutely need to know that. Why is the founding of Jamestown so important? Not the first settlement, the first the first settlement of who? Yes, very good. It's the first English settlement in North America. It's not the first settlement in North America, first English settlement, okay? 1607. All right. So very important to keep this in mind, pre-Columbian era. This is early American history. You probably haven't heard too much about this since we uh, since we started our units. This is definitely a topic that you're probably the least familiar with. Okay, so let's talk about the geography of Europe. All right, we have the southwestern portion of the United States. This is going to represent places like modern day Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, but most of what you probably know is actually going to be in Mexico. All right. So let's talk about one of the key groups that's going to be in this particular area. The Pueblos, you need to write down this term. The Pueblos are going to be in the southwestern portion of the United States. P-U-E-B-L-O-S. Pueblo is a key word that means town or village. They look a lot like this. So if you take a look on your second page, you'll notice that there is going to be like almost like a city, established cities. The reason why there are established cities is because of the fact that they have permanent settlements. The main reason why there's permanent settlements is because they have agricultural production. Agricultural production that you need to know is going to be maize or the production of corn. Maize, M-A-I-Z-E, maize. P-U-E-B-L-O-S. Pueblo. Yes. Southwestern portion of the United States. Okay. So very important thing to keep in mind because of the fact that there is a higher number of people or there's a higher agricultural output. It means that there is a larger population. This region, southwestern portion of the United States, and most importantly, modern day Mexico City, is going to have the larger population centers comparatively to other regions throughout the Northeast, the Southeast, Northwest, because they have more food. More food means more babies. More babies, obviously, is going to be higher population. These are permanent villages. Most important city that I would definitely write down is Tetnochitlan. Tell that one out. Yep. T E N. Please, everybody, all together, listen. No Chitlan is T E N O C H I T L A N. They had a population of around 250,000 people, which back then was actually quite substantial. It's called Tetno Chitlan. 
So in our curriculum, they really emphasize the fact that this particular region is able to mass produce, have a larger population because of irrigation. Okay, so they have irrigation growth uh, because they're able to farm a lot more. Okay, let's talk about uh, the Great Basin or the Great Plains. So that's the second column on our second page. Now, if we look right here, this is the region that we are talking about. It's a very flat land. It's very flat. There's a lack of natural resources. There isn't as much uh, lumber in this region the way that there would be in the Northeast. But they do make use of their resources like bison. They are going to be hunting bison. Now, very important, pre-Columbian, do they have horses? Absolutely not. There are no horses in North America at all until the Spanish come, okay? So the, the image of the Native Americans like, you know, hunting on horseback, that doesn't happen until after the Columbian exchange, which we'll talk about in just a second. But the Great Plains, um, they're going to follow the bison, all right? There's uh, going to be greater mobility after the introduction of horses, okay? Okay. The next one talks about the northeastern portion of the United States. Um, so this is the northeast or the Atlantic coast or the Mississippi, coast, uh, Mississippi River Basin. So one of the groups that I would want you to know is the Iroquois. I R O Q U O I S. The Iroquois centered in New York, modern day New York and Pennsylvania. They have a combination in the northeastern portion of the U.S. They have a combination of maize production, and they also are going to be doing hunting and gathering. So they have a mixed economy. They're going to be able to make use of their resources the same way that the Plains people do, but they're going to have a mix, mixture of, of uh, production of, of uh, crops like maize, and also hunting and gathering. So when you think about these groups of people, you're probably gonna think about like Pocahontas situation. They had like some maize production, but they also did hunting and gathering. This is a very matriarchal society. Matriarchal is spelled M-A-T-R-I-A-R-C-H-A-L, matriarchal, yeah. This is means power based upon the mother or power based upon females. Because of the fact that this society develops in a much more egalitarian, that's a fancy word for equal, egalitarian means equal, um, it's going to ultimately result in the fact that women have a greater importance. When you're providing the food for the family, you're basically seen as essential to the family unit. Not every time that you go hunting are you going to be able to get a kill. So a lot of times the community is dependent upon women in order to get their food. And so what we're going to see is that it becomes very matriarchal because women are empowered. Do you have a question, Sophia? Okay, cool. So with that being said, women play a major role in decision-making. Okay, and a key city that you need to know about this region of the Mississippi Basin is called Cahokia. I'm telling you, you haven't heard of these. It's C. A H O K I A, Cahokia. This is in uh, the Northeast Mississippi Basin. So it's kind of like at the crossroads. This is in St. Louis, St. Louis region. Okay. Uh, what's that? Yeah. C A H O K I A, Cahokia. So this is going to have about 30,000 people, okay? They're known for their mound building. They're like kind of like big pyramid almost type of things that are made out of like dirt. And they had probably like temples on top of them, made out of wood most likely. The mounds tend to be about 100 feet tall, okay? And then we have our Northwestern Territory, specifically going to be focusing along the Pacific Ocean coast, okay? These individuals um, are going to be hunting and gathering mostly, not, they're not gonna be producing maize the way that the other societies are, but they're gonna be doing hunting and gathering with fish and nuts. 
One of the groups that you would want to know for the northwestern portion of the U.S. is the Chinooks. C-H-I-N-O-O-K-S. C-H-I-N-O-O-K-S. They have warrior traditions. And this is where you know they live in longhouses. They build the, um, uh, they, they're going to build the uh, totem poles. Northwestern United States. Okay, so big idea for all of this that I would want you to be able to identify, okay, is that all of these Native American groups, this is very important, will adapt to their environments, adapt to their environments accordingly. They will adapt to their environments. They have very complex societies. Some are obviously going to be more socially stratified, meaning that they have a very strong, like, upper class, middle class, lower class groups of people. Some of them have settled cities. Some of them live on the plains and they're moving with the, with the herds. Some of them have permanent villages, but all of them are adapting to their environments accordingly. Cool beans. And for the most part, a lot of them are producing maize or corn, okay? However, some of them are not, okay? So let's move on to page number three on our document. Let's talk about the major motives for exploration and colonization. So you probably remember this from world history. This is going to center around God, glory, and gold, the three Gs, all right? These are the major reasons why people during this time period are going to go out and invest into, the, um, into creating uh, networks across the sea. All right. One of them is God. So with the religious uh, fervor that we're going to see during this time, very important, which religion is going to be primarily responsible for spreading their religion? Yes, but I need a specific sect because it's, it is the Spanish and it's going to be fall under Roman Catholicism. Make sure you understand that. The Spanish initially are spreading Catholicism. All right, that's their main objective, to spread their religion. They're going to convert the natives. Their top priority is to build Spanish missions. That's an important word, Spanish missions. The Spanish will establish these missions all throughout the north, uh, the, yeah, the northwestern portion of the United States, pretty much going up through California. If you think about cities like San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, right? They're named after saints. Los Angeles is city of angels, right? So they're Spanish names because they were basically mission zones to try to convert the Native Americans. These systems, the Spanish, uh, the Spanish mission systems, this is going to be a great opportunity for them to convert Native Americans and to get them to assimilate, if you will, over to their cult and over to their um, over to their religion. It's the Spanish mission system, like they're missionaries. The next one is gold. Economically speaking, this is a time period in which we are going to see a massive influx of people who are going to try to make new markets or make money off of uh, trying to get gold and silver. That was a primary reason why Christopher Columbus went in search of the new world and was able to bring back some of that gold, which really increased the interest economically to invest into that region. So they're looking for spices, trade markets, precious metals, all right, and most importantly, profit. Economically speaking, being able to, ex being able to create a network of trade, this is going to be a primary factor for a lot of these countries like Spain. They're the first ones that are essentially there. And then glory. Very important thing is to feel pride and powerful, all right? A lot of times these individuals are seeking to have adventure, um, and also it's going to be able to show the other European nations how strong they are. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of motives for them to go out and do this. All righty. Boom. The most important topic of the pre-Columbian, or I'm sorry about this particular unit, is going to be the Columbian exchange. So we're on page number four of our document. The Columbian exchange is a transfer of goods from and also diseases 
from one region of the world to the other. Okay, so what's coming from North America to Europe and what's going from Europe over to America. So this is what we call the Colombian exchange. You know, like how Italians are really big and into like, you know, tomato sauce. Don't have tomatoes until the Colombian exchange. Okay, so the pizza pies that you eat today, they wouldn't have, if we didn't have this Colombian exchange, there wouldn't be any tomatoes, okay, uh, in, in Italy. So potatoes, you know, you think about Irish and you think about the potato famine, they didn't even have potatoes until the Colombian exchange, right? Corn was only indigenous on once in, uh, was only in North America and South America, so they didn't have that. So a lot of these foods are going over to Europe which a lot of these foods are starchy, which means that they are going to be high in nutrients and calories. So what's going to happen to the population in Europe? Yes, fantastic. It's going to go up a lot. It's also going to make our food taste a lot better because not for nothing, I love myself some avocado toast. But just saying. All right. But what, the, what we're going to see coming from Europe they're going to be giving them um, like horses, for example, cattle. They're going to be giving them other things as well. However, the big thing that they're going to be bringing over or exporting is going to be um, is going to be the diseases. You need to know at least smallpox. You need to know smallpox. No, Europeans bring that over to North America and Central America and South America. In fact, from things like smallpox, influenza, malaria, measles, all those things, we estimate that there is about 90% of the Native American population will be decimated by the diseases. 90%. So because of this, we're going to see that this is going to help to increase economic activity, but it's really important. This leads to the rise of capitalism. There's more population, there's more money being made, capitalism is on the rise. And as a result, this exchange also leads to an exchange of knowledge as well. Okay. Yeah, there's syphilis that comes from the Americas to Europe, but no, we're not as deadly. Okay. The next one, the next topic focuses on improvements in maritime technology. Maritime is a fancy word for being able to travel on the seas. These are examples of how we're going to see improvements, the compass, the sextant. Is that funny? <laughs> the sextant is really important because it is used to find the exact position on the earth. All right. <laughs> All right. The Carvel is not the ice cream, it's a ship. <laughs> what? Wait, it's a Lincoln. We don't have to work there. <laughs> it finds the direct position on the earth. Yeah. It's like a way to. Like it's kind of like a telescope type of thing, but you can use the stars to navigate and positions of planets and stuff like that. All right, Escuchen. Guys, I want to get you out of here in an hour. So, all right. Next thing uh, that we're going to be focusing on is that this is also going to lead to the rise of joint stock companies, which is what we see right here. Joint stock companies. This is basically a bunch of people coming together, pulling their money together, they share the risk, but they also share the reward if it pans out okay. If one singular person puts all of their money and all their eggs in one basket and the basket gets thrown overseas because of a hurricane, they lost everything. But 
if you only put one of your eggs in there and then 10 other people put their eggs in that basket, you only lost a fraction of it. But if the return comes back, you can make a lot of money. So that's how capitalism rises is through these joint stock companies. The example of this is going to be the founding of Jamestown. Jamestown was founded with a joint stock company with the intention to find gold. Didn't find that though. So I mentioned this before. This is an early depiction of what actually happened to Native Americans. Uh, this is how they viewed the, ex, um, the exposure to deadly diseases. One of them is going to be smallpox. Okay, This is going to ultimately kill a large portion of the population within North America. Smallpox, measles, these are all, this is all going to decrease the population of North America, Central America, and South America. But with that transfer of well, of that transfer of foods to Europe, we saw an increase of that population. So, really important to kind of keep in mind is that this is part of the reason why colonization is easier than it would have been if these people weren't exposed to the diseases. When you have 90% less of the people to fight you on the land, guess what? You're going to be able to take over that land. And that's why westward expansion is going to be so possible because there isn't a lot of resistance capabilities. The Native Americans weren't necessarily united. They weren't, and they weren't populous enough for them to be. All right. Another key term that's specifically mentioned in our curriculum is called the encomienda system. Yes. I probably mentioned it in other ways, but. Oh, really? All right. Here we go. So Native Americans are going to be used in a forced labor system known as the encomienda system, which is what you're going to write down. It's a forced labor system. This is a depiction of the encomienda system. Essentially, what the Spanish crown would do is they would give like nobles in, in Spain, they would give them a plot of land and they would give them the Native Americans who lived there and they would force them to either produce sugar production. Uh, they would be forced to mine the, the, uh, the gold or the silver, or whatever they were working on on that land. And ultimately, this encomienda system is going to marshal, that's the key word, that marshaled the Native Americans. It arranged them or assembled them. That's what marshaled means. And it's a forced labor system. Now, because of the loss of population of the Native Americans, because the Native Americans were pretty savvy and knew the land well, eventually this encomienda system is going to fall apart. Also, it's going to lead to the rise of, it's going to lead to the rise of our slave system that we're going to see. Just see if that's, yes. So the encomienda system is the introduction of slavery to North America um, and South America and Central America from the Europeans. In 1542, a law will be passed in which they will outlaw the uh, they will outlaw this encomienda system. 1542. So pretty much after this date, you are going to see a massive influx in the use of slave labor. Slave trade is going to increase. All righty. Ready? So, after, after we are going to see the encomienda system, we see the slave trade will increase. This is the massive influx of the use of slave labor from Africa. A lot of times it's from the West Coast, geographically speaking, that's geographically closer to North, Central, and South America. West Africa, we're going to see that that will import a lot of those individuals over to the Caribbean islands. You can mention uh, states like uh, Barbados. The slave trade is going to increase production. 
but it's also going to lead to a lot of the issues that we're going to see lasting and uh, stemming all the way into modern times. A lot of these countries have created a very eclectic culture, mixing of culture from like Europe, Africa, and uh, Native American populations. This is eventually going to be what we'll, we're going to be talking about in period two, which will be the triangular trade, which is going to bring those slaves over um, throughout that time period. And it, as we know in American history, it really did capital, it really did increase a lot of the tensions throughout our history, um, especially leading into the Civil War. Yes, sir. Was there slavery in Europe? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there definitely was. Um, I don't think to the same extent. The primary reason why that's the case is because Europe is in perfect growing seasons for plantations. Plantations were very much utilized in places like the Canary Islands, but mostly in the Caribbean, the sugar production you're going to see. Okay. All right. Social classes. In this early American history, which you probably maybe not have heard of. Oh, goodness. Did something happen? I think my thing went out. Yeah, that I don't know if that'll work. All right. Everyone, were you able to get that? Are you able to hear me? No. Well, we can hear you now. But okay. We All right, cool. I'm just going to reshare. That was weird. We dropped. Okay. Are you going to post the packet on Classroom? Oh, I'm sorry, guys, at home. That's my bad. Yeah, it's, I'm just like kind of talking and you're... <laughs> yes, I'm posting it right now. Maddie, can you do me a favor? Can you, on my computer, I have a roster there. Can you just take a look around and see if there's anybody that I'm missing? Because I think a lot of people came in later. Yeah. You're my hero. I'm so sorry, people at home. It's okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. I had them all ready to go. Oh, no. How are those sandwiches? I believe it. All right. Cool. Sorry, people, about that. All righty. All right. Attention. So, because of the massive influx of different groups of people, there is going to be a need to organize those people. First group, first class, if you will, will be the peninsular, Peninsulares. These are people who are born on the Iberian Peninsula. Everyone knows what that is, I assume. It's Spain. Spain is a peninsula because there's water on all four sides. And Portugal. I'm sorry, Portugal too. Peninsulares. Peninsulares are going to be the top of this pyramid. They are purely European. Okay. They are at the top. They're born in Spain. They come from Spain and they live in the New World. And therefore, they are at the top of the pyramid. Below them are the Creoles. These are the people who are Spanish. They are bl their blood is Spanish, but they were born in the New World. So they're viewed socially below the peninsulares because they were born here in the New World or in places like Mexico. But they are European descent. And then the two groups that you definitely need to know is going to be the mestizos. Mestizos, M-E-S-T-I-Z-O-S, -E which is a mixture of European and Native American blood. And the mulattoes, not Mr. Mulatto, but the mulattoes, 
which is a mixed blood of slave and also European. Yes. Yes. Mixing of blood. Mexico, like if you look at Mexicans, okay, Mexicans specifically, there's a lot of, like you can see like there's a mixture of that bloodlines. So yeah. A lot of times it could be forced, especially with slave labor, or it could be a situation of choice. And then everyone at the bottom of that pyramid is obviously the Native Americans and the black slaves. Okay. So we're going to do real quick. We're going to talk about Native American beliefs. I broke this up into three categories, gender, land, and religion, gender, land, and religion. Okay. When it comes to gender, gender, it is a more, more so than not more matriarchal, especially in North America. Matriarchal meaning power is given to the mother bloodline. Women are more empowered. There's a lot more egalitarian views about the two genders, male and female, because they have to work together to provide for the families. Okay. Land specifically is going to not necessarily, especially in like Northern America, is more viewed as like a communal. We all are using this. Together we're using this. It's a community viewpoint of land. This is one of the major reasons why when the Europeans come here, there's, and especially English, there's a lot of tension because that view of land not belonging to one person or one family is very different than their own beliefs. But in North America, the land was viewed as being for everyone to share. The next thing is on religion, okay? So there's a word that you need to know. It's a key term. It's called animism. A-N-I-M-I-S-M. It basically means like you believe that there are spirits in nature, okay? So you know, like with Pocahontas, the movie, like she's talking about, you know, the colors of the wind and she's talking about like, she sees like, you know, in the tree, she touches the tree and it lights up, you know, she touches the, the animals. There's a spirit in all of the, all of nature. So animism is that there's that viewpoint that everything is alive, not necessarily the way that we see it. And also very polytheistic. What does polytheistic mean? Yes, fantastic. They are also going to make use of something called a shaman or a medicine man. Shamans, medicine man. Shaman is S-H-A-M-A-N-S. So all of this combined, gender views, land, and also religion views, makes the Native Americans extremely different than the people who came here from Europe. European countries had an established nobility. European countries had established monotheistic traditions. They also had a very heteronormative society whereby males are higher and women are lesser and so on and so forth. Okay. So as European encroachments on Native American lands happened, we are going to see that there is some disputes about this encroachment of Europeans coming onto Native American lands. So a lot of Native Americans will try to maintain a sense of political sovereignty. What do I mean by sovereignty? Yeah, them ruling themselves. Very good. So there's going to be this idea of autonomy or this idea that you need to have self-rule. So the early Native Americans will try to use diplomacy in order to get what they want to be self-ruling. They will trade and they will work with the, with the new Europeans in order to maintain their independence. Their main goal is to hold on to those political, those um, economic, 
views, their gender views. They're trying to hold on to those things. All right. That one doesn't have too much, but this is probably the most important component. Last page. Bartolome de las Casas. You need to know his name. There's no question about it. He's as important. He's the, he's, if you will, like a civil rights leader of his time. I want you to equate him to like the Martin Luther Kings, the Betty Friedans, the different people who are fighting for civil rights. Bartolome de las Casas is going to argue that we need to treat Native Americans with some respect. And that Native Americans should not be treated in such harsh conditions. He's going to be the one that will advocate to get rid of the encomienda system. He and this other guy, Juan de Supelvida. Supelvida? Supelvida? Yeah. <laughs> is on the opposing team. Juan de Supelvida is going to say, no, Native Americans are lesser. They are slave labor. The Bible supports the use of slave labor. And therefore, as a society, we should not treat them with any kind of, uh, with any type of respect. So during these debates between these two individuals, it is going to highlight the idea uh, that these Native Americans need to be treated with some kind of respect. And eventually the, the, the Spanish will side with Bartolome de las Casas when they outlaw the encomienda system. Okay. Very, very important. Yes, sir. What's the uh, ethnic background of Bartolome? Both of them are Spanish. Yep. Okay. Okay. On the front of your document, right here, this is now the second, uh, this page right here. I do want to write down some things on here, but I we're going to write it on here just because there's more space. Okay. You're going to write it on this. Yes? The period one review. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So this time period, 1491 to 1607 needs to be ingrained into your head. Okay. It equates for only about 5% of the AP U.S. history exam. However, the big ideas are focused on the two key concepts, key concept 1.1 and key concept 1.2. This is what 1.1 says. As Native American populations migrated and settled across the vast expanse of North America over time, they developed an, increasing, a, an increasingly complex society adapting and transforming to their diverse environments. Okay, so give me an example of how they are going to I, adapt to their environments. Yes, Ryan. Sure. Okay. They, they attempted to, you know, work with other groups of people like the, the Europeans, but I'm talking about their environment. Yes. Yeah. So which region are we going to see hunting and farming? Perfect. We're going to see that the great plains or the great by, um, basin is going to basically have a lot of hunting of what kind of animal bison. Perfect. Sean. Irrigation systems, especially in places where there are going to be pueblos. And which region of the United States do we see irrigation systems? Southwest. southwest. Fantastic. Give me a city that is going to be within the southwestern portions of the United States or southwestern region. Tenochtitlan? All right. Give me a major city within the region of St. Louis. Cahokia. Very good. Yes. All right. So let's write down some of these key um, ideas. They are adapting to their, their environments. All right. They are, have a mixture of their, they have a mixture of different like 
they're like hunting, gathering. Some of them are producing. What kind of, what's corn? What's the fancy word for corn? Fantastic. Awesome. Good stuff. Key concept. 1.2 says contact among Europeans, Native Americans, Africa, Africans resulted in the Colombian exchange and significant social, cultural, political changes on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. What major change did the Colombian exchange bring to Europe? What did it bring? Yes, what kind of foods did we bring? Corn, absolutely. Potatoes, absolutely. What's up? Tomatoes, very good. What did the Europeans, yes, son? Disease goes where? Yes. So Europeans are bringing over, they're also bringing over some good things. What beneficial thing did they bring over, especially to the Plains people? Horses. Fantastic. And, but really detrimental is the diseases. Give me one disease. Perfect. Awesome. So these are the big ideas from this time period. 1491, this is Christopher Columbus claims that islands of Hispaniola and Cuba, he claims it for Spain. Okay. In 1512, Spain will establish the encomienda system. 1519, that's when Hernan Cortes will invade Mexico. And by 1525, the first ship of slaves of Afri uh, from Africa arrives in the Americas. These key terms, maize, Christopher Columbus, God, glory, and gold, and encomienda system, we have all covered today. Okay? And we should be able to identify some of those key components. All right. Awesome. First thing that we want to do is we want to do a practice. Okay. This is, I know, right? It's kind of scary, but the reality is everyone that you are going to have to take a test, this period one test. It will happen quickly. <laughs> it will be here before you know it. I can't even believe we're talking about AP, um, that we're already talking about taking the AP exam, but realistically, I just calculated, we have like nine more weeks, right? Um, 10 technically without spring break, but realistically, you're taking this exam really quick, all right? May 6th. Okay. Mm -hmm. All righty. All right, people, give me one second at home. I'm going to pause now. All right, everyone, this is the review for this topic.